Genesis chapter 45, as we continue our study in the life of Joseph, a man like Jesus. One of the most wonderful things about Bible study is that we're able to learn from the mistakes of others. We don't have to go down every path to find out it's a dead end. We don't have to make every mistake to find out that sin has consequences. And so we're not only authorized in Scripture and by Scripture, but exhorted to learn from the events, from the people, from the situations of the Old Testament. Now, as we've been examining Joseph's life, God has brought us to a point where he is about to reconcile with his brothers. And if you're new to the whole story, I'll give you that uh, one minute review. Joseph was hated by his brothers because he was the favorite of his father. They were so bitter toward him. They actually at one point put him into a pit, leaving him there to die. One of the brothers, Judah, suggested rather than leaving him to die, they sell him into slavery, which they did. He ended up in the house of a man named Potiphar, where he was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife of coming on to her when he refused to get involved with her. From there, he ended up in the prison. And then finally from the prison, he was exalted to second in Egypt, there in the palace of the Pharaoh. Now, through all of these circumstances and situations, God was working in Joseph, preparing Joseph. And he was also working in the lives of Joseph's brothers who had rejected him. And where we're at today has to do with the restoration of their family relationships. And if there's anything we can learn from Scripture, it's that, at least in this portion of Scripture... It's that damaged family relationships are something God is interested in. He is a God of restoration, a God of reconciliation. And once we're right with him, he immediately goes to work on us to make things right with others. Now, sometimes it's a slow and painful process. It takes over 20 years for these guys and a series of rather incredible events. But what we saw in the very last part of chapter 44, was not only had Joseph's brothers come to some real conviction, they were remorseful for their sin against him. Once more, they'd repented of that sin, confessing that what they'd done was wrong and actually forsaken it, if you will. No longer having a heart set on his destruction, but regretting and repenting of ever and setting up that kind of a scenario, that kind of a situation. That brings about fertile soil for reconciliation, for restoration, for forgiveness. And so the latter part, as I started to say, Judah actually offers himself up. A situation had occurred set up by Joseph trying to test his brother's hearts. And if you're not familiar at all, It's so bizarre of a story because after being sold into slavery and then interpreting a dream and and all this stuff, he ends up there in Egypt. During a time of famine, his brothers come and bow down before him, but they don't recognize him because he's grown, he's an Egyptian or looks like an Egyptian. And in the midst of all of that, he begins to try to find out where are these guys at? Are they sorry for what they did to me? Are they repentant for what they did to me? Now, here's the good news. God looks right at our hearts. He doesn't need any kind of outward demonstration for him to know what's going on inwardly. But people do. And Joseph, like any of us, wanted to know where the heart of his brothers were. Well, Judah says, listen, as they had set up little Benjamin, putting a a, a cup in his sack of grain and if you weren't here for any of this all of this just seems like wow i don't understand it's like completely oblivious or i'm oblivious just go back and read from chapter 037 and then at 39 on and get some historical background on what we're looking at today don't do it now though wait till after and so uh anyway they set little benjamin up and and uh, judah comes and says listen I, i i can't go home without benjamin Our father loves little Benjamin. And and if I were to return without him, it would break our father's heart. It might kill him. 
And so Judah offers himself in Benjamin's place. And at this point, Joseph's heart breaks. He sees that Judah now, and no doubt the others, are concerned with their father. They are concerned with their little brother, Benjamin. And so he decides it's time to reveal himself. Verses 1 through 4 are, in fact, a record of that revelation. Joseph could no longer restrain himself before all who stood by him. He cried out, make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud and the Egyptians of the house of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed at his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, please come near to me. And they came near and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Seeing that now Judah was concerned, not just remorseful. And it's easy to regret that we've been busted or we're going through a hard time because of our sin. But not just remorseful, but repentant. Joseph sets out to restore them. And what he does is, first of all, he just tells them, hey, I'm Joseph. They don't believe it at first. He says it in verse 3. He says it again in verse 4. I'm Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now, if he wasn't Joseph, then how would he have known? And so they're starting to wake up to the reality that Joseph is not only still alive, but somehow he's been exalted and now he's second in command here in all of Egypt. Well, their response to this, depending on the translation of the Bible you're reading, is they were dismayed or they were discomforted. A good translation would be terrified. I don't know if any of your Bibles actually say that, but that would be an accurate translation of their immediate response and emotion. They were absolutely terrified. Why? Because Joseph would have been just to put them in a pit. Leave them there for a while. He would have been just to take them as slaves. He would have been just to put them in prison. You see, all he'd experienced at their hand, they could have received at his. And he was in a position to do it. Now, we're going to see some profound things as it relates to this reality of restoration, especially restoration with those who've hurt us, who've wounded us, who've offended us. I would doubt today that most of us or many of us or if really any of us have experienced such bizarre treatment at the hand of their own family. But that's what's going on here. So these guys are absolutely terrified. I want you to see that Joseph immediately sets out to reassure them. He says, listen, don't be grieved or angry with yourselves. And he begins to reveal why he was able to do this. We pick up at verse 5 where he says, don't be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Now, these two years, the famine has been in the land and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth, to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was... Not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Having revealed who he was and seeing their immediate response, their reaction, he wants to reassure them. Now, he's not saying they weren't responsible for their sin in selling him into slavery or sending him off to Egypt. They were responsible. But what he is saying is that God is greater than our sin. God is greater than anything that's going on. And God, in his sovereignty, overcame all of this, had a plan and a purpose in mind. And so he was able to reassure them and is about to restore them. How was Joseph able to do that? It's worth us asking. First of all, Joseph was at this time, as he had always been, aware of God's presence with him. And when you're aware that God's not only for you, though he absolutely is, but he's with you, it's a lot easier 
to look at people who've wounded, who've offended, who've hurt you, and think, God, you're with me, you're for me, you've forgiven me all, I'm going to forgive them as well. So he was aware of God's abiding presence. When he was in the pit, God, we're told, was with him in the pit. When he was in the prison, God was with him in the prison. When he was in Potiphar's house, God was with him in the house of Potiphar. And now in the palace, God is with him in the palace. And so he was aware of God's abiding presence. The second key, and this should help many of us here today, he was aware of God's purpose for him. God's presence with him and his purpose for him. Now, if you know what God's called you to do, if you know why you're in this world, it's a lot easier to deal with the trials, the tribulations, the persecutions, the rejections, the hardships that we endure. And the truth is we all go through it. We all experience it. There's a rather interesting passage in the New Testament where we're told that our Lord and Savior Jesus was tempted in all ways, yet without sin. That means just like us, he was tempted to bitterness. Just like us, he was tempted to hate those who despised him and hurt him and handed him over and crucified him. That just like us, he was tempted to get revenge. The difference is he was actually in a position to do it all, as Joseph was here. But Jesus... Though he was tempted in all ways, we're told he was yet without sin. He didn't grow bitter. He didn't hate those who crucified him. In fact, he prayed from the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Now, as a young Christian, I used to think, well, yeah, but he was the son of God. I mean, what about a guy like me who's been wounded or hurt or or rejected? Well, listen. Joseph was a guy like me. He was a guy like us. Stephen, first Christian martyr recorded in the New Testament. We saw his martyrdom on uh, our Wednesday night study. He prayed, don't lay this sin to their charge. Another guy just like us, made of the same stuff as us. And so it's not only possible to forgive It's God's will that we do. It's not only possible to restore broken relationships. It's God's plan and purpose that we do. Well, he says three times, God sent me before you. And he says, first of all, he sent me before you to preserve life. Was he doing that? Absolutely. He was preserving the lives of all in Egypt. And now that famine had spread out into Canaan and other territories. And he was preserving life there as well. Once more, he says, God sent me here to preserve a posterity for you. God was concerned with that family. Why? Well, he had chosen Abraham, his son Isaac, his son Jacob, and now he is continuing that line to bring about the Messiah. And so this family and the generations that would follow, those who were alive at this point in history, they were precious to the Lord and an important part of his plan. You know what's difficult for us? It's hard for us to see how God might want to work in our families. If you're anything like me, you know, when you got saved, you probably went and tried to share with your family. Not everyone's immediately receptive. We're going to see that was true even in this passage. But I began to wonder about some of my family and others. Man, they came to Christ and they began to grow. And there's some good things that happen and some bad things that happen. But we live too close to the situation. We don't have... God's perspective on the situation. And that's what Joseph really did have. He could say, and he will say much later in all of this, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Were they accountable for their sin? Absolutely. Don't think for a moment God wanted them to sin or tempted them to sin or set up the scenario for their sin. All he did was not keep them from sinning against him. So Joseph was sent ahead to preserve life, to preserve a posterity for future generations. He says to save your lives by a great deliverance. He'd become a father to Pharaoh, a counselor, provider, and protector. He was Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all Egypt. Now that's what he said God sent him to Egypt to do. But it's doubtful that when he was in the pit, he had any idea. 
And when he was in Potiphar's house, I doubt that he thought, all this will lead to glory. And when he was in prison, certainly he was prone to despair. And, you know, there's a psalm that says they hurt him there, that he suffered there in prison. And so it's important to know that while we're looking at the end of the story and it's sort of a happy ending, this was over 20 years after they'd rejected him, sold him into slavery. And now there's this opportunity to restore well as we've often seen and as more often the case than not there are some very clear parallels here spiritually and i don't want to miss these before we look at this next section of the restoration first of all when joseph reveals himself to his brethren they're terrified and i've seen this happen in the lives of a lot of people who've come to christ Ordinarily, though, when we first come to Christ, it's because we come to grips with the fact that God did, in fact, create us. You know, the whole world doesn't buy that, doesn't believe it. Lots of people think we're here by accident. We just sort of evolved. And, and you know, that, that actually would be more of a miracle than creation for something without life to become life and something without organization to organize itself. I mean, you know what happens when you don't keep things going. They disorganize themselves. You know, all around you. There has to be energy and there has to be intelligence for there to be organization. But I'm not really here today to talk about creation versus evolution. I simply want to point out that when people come to grips with the fact that they were, in fact, created by God and for God, and when they're presented with the reality that there really is a heaven and there really is a hell, And all of us are going to end up in one of those two places. Well, lots of people, if they're just thinking right at all, say, well, let's see, heaven or hell? I'll go for heaven. you got to be pretty dense to think, well, I'll try hell and see how it goes. (laughs) I don't know what those people in their album covers are thinking, you know, the the ones who say, well, I want to go to hell and be with my friends. (laughs) Wake up. It's not going to be a party. It's It's... Way worse than you can even begin to imagine. But here's what I've observed. Many people come to faith in Christ because they come to the realization that they can't save themselves. And I hope you've come that far. And if not, that you do today. That you realize God isn't interested in your reforming yourself. You need to be born again of His Spirit. It's not reformation. It's regeneration. It's not turning over a new leaf. It's a whole new life. A spiritual life that's all about him and so if you come that far one of the things that happens is you begin to see him more clearly you first hear he's a merciful savior and you say well look i want that lord forgive me my sin come into my life and then a few months into your experience as a new believer you experience what these guys experienced at the revelation of their brother joseph and that's absolute terror as you begin to realize I'm much worse than I thought. I'm far worse of a sinner than I ever imagined. Have you had that experience? Many of you recently, and you've spoken to me about it. I have people come in who say, I just don't know if I'm really a Christian. Well, I say, well, what's troubling you? What's making you think that? Well, I came to Christ, but I've still sinned since. And I had some pretty bad sin since. Well, that the fact that you're sinning isn't automatically an evidence that you're not a Christian. The fact that you're troubled over your sin is an evidence that you probably have come to Christ. That now you're guilty over something you used to excuse. That now you're trembling and troubled over something you used to think was no big deal. But many people find themselves terrified because they realize for the first time the depth of their depravity and the holiness of God and they realize as no doubt Joseph's brothers did I deserve punishment I deserve separation I deserve this and more but God in his grace seeks to reassure us and so if you're there at this point maybe you've come to Christ recently and you've had just the most miserable week and you've fallen and you've stumbled listen God wants to reassure you today and he wants to restore you. Sin does break fellowship. But when you're a child of God, he'll never turn his back on you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He'll never cast you off. So even as Joseph reassures his brothers, 
God says, listen, I'm here to preserve your life. He doesn't just give you the gift of life. He preserves you, seals you with his Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. He's also interested in your family. He says he not only preserves your life, but he has in mind preserving a posterity, raising up a godly seed. He saves our lives, even as Joseph was saving theirs, by a great deliverance. And then Jesus becomes to us a counselor, our provider, our protector, our Lord, and he rules over us. Well, Joseph at this point has not only forgiven them and restored them, he begins to demonstrate his care, his compassion, and his concern for them and for their families. You might say Joseph loved them. And this is so important. Because if you thought, well, okay, I know God's with me and I know God has a plan and a purpose for me, but I still have a hard time forgiving those who've wounded and offended me. Well, welcome to the club. We all do. That's human nature. But here's the thing. We are recipients of God's mercy and forgiveness. And he makes it so clear that in order for that flow of his goodness to continue into our lives it needs to flow through our lives and the real demonstration of joseph's love isn't just that he forgave them and then sent them away but that he forgave them and drew them in and i would covet your prayers for me personally in this area and i'll pray for you in this area that those who've wounded who've offended who've spoken evil of us falsely And it happens to everyone at some point in time that we would have a heart to forgive and once more we'd be willing to restore. And how do we know if we love them? When we're willing not just to forgive them, but we're willing to bless them, see? That's what he's about doing. For love to be real, for love to be biblical, it has to be demonstrable, it has to be tangible, and it has to be practical. That's why when the Bible describes love for us in that oh so famous passage, 1 Corinthians 13, he doesn't say love is warm and love is emotional and love is gushy and mushy and smoochy. No, he says love is kind, love is patient, long-suffering. Love manifests itself in practical, demonstrable, tangible ways. Now, see, God knows if we love him, but he says we can know if we're loving him by obeying him. How will people know we love him? We've got to demonstrate it. How will they know we love them? We've got to demonstrate it. And so we see his instructions for them and to them, his plan for them. In verse 9, he says, hey, hasten and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all of Egypt Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen. You shall be near me, your children, your children's children, your flocks, your herds, all that you have. There I will provide for you, lest you and your household and all that you have uh, come to poverty. And there are still five years of famine. Now, it's a side note, but worth considering. When Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's dream and said there's going to be five years of or seven years of plenty then seven years of famine it was absolutely by faith that Pharaoh received that do you realize that then people say oh this whole Christian thing it's just faith hey everything's just faith it's the question is is where is our faith is it in God's solid word is it in his revelation of himself and his truth or is it in something or someone else We all have faith and we all exercise it. And so when Joseph said, this is what's coming, they by faith began to prepare for what was ahead. They by faith began to store up goods knowing that the famine would come, even though it was a time of plenty. And I want to suggest we need to do the same. While we may not need to store up physically, well, it doesn't hurt to have you know, a few extra batteries and a little extra water. You know what's kind of interesting? We just got through that whole year anniversary of Y2K when so many people were freaking out and worried. I'll tell you, I was way more concerned this week 
for today than I ever was about Y2K. Why? There were real rolling blackouts. There's a genuine electricity shortage and gas shortage right now. Whether it was brought about and how it came about, that, that's not even an issue for us right now. But I wasn't paranoid over it. I wasn't worried about it. But I was aware that this was real and could be a problem for us today and a problem for many today. I prayed that we'd have power today, that we'd have electricity, lights and heat and, and microphones and all that stuff working. Why? Well, I want to be able to share God's word with you. But it's important to know that people were told, hey, there's going to be this big Y2K and the computers are going to crash and nothing's going to work and we're going to be in a big mess. And people believed it, though it wasn't true. And they prepared as if it were true. Now, here's how that applies to many hearts today. The Bible says make preparation spiritually. It's an absolute. Every single person here is only going to live so long. And we're either going to die and stand before God and know that he's our Lord and Savior and hear, welcome, come on in, well done. Or we're going to hear, depart from me. And bottom line is you want to make provision today. You want to be ready today. You want to be sure. This isn't a Y2K might happen. It's an absolute going to happen. How do I know? I have faith in the word of God. And he's shown himself to be faithful throughout history. And his word always happens as he promises it will. Well, we see this. Joseph says, here's what's going to happen. They believe it. By faith, they make preparation. I pray you do the same today. Well, he goes on to say, look at. I want to provide for you, verse 11, lest you and your household and all you have come to poverty. And in verse 12, behold, your eyes, the eyes of my brother Benjamin, see, it's really me. It's my mouth that speaks to you. And you shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and of all you've seen. And you shall hasten and bring my father down here. And he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept on his neck and he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. And after that, all his brothers talked with him. Now, verses 16 down through 20, Pharaoh gets wind of what's up and just affirms that Joseph's plan is a good one. Send for your brothers. Here's some goods to get them back here safely. Take these carts so they don't have to make the long journey without them. Pharaoh reaffirms what Joseph is trying to do. But I want you to see what his plan for them is, his purpose for them is. Because it applies again to us spiritually. His instruction toward them and plan for them is that they would be with him. That he would provide for them. And of course, as I've already shared, Pharaoh is in absolute agreement. Now what happens next is amazing. He says, go home and share the good news. And for those of you who are familiar with the New Testament and familiar with the gospel, the good news of the New Testament, that though we've all sinned and come short of God's glory, though the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus, who loved demonstrably, practically, intangibly, so loved this world, and the Father so loved this world, and you a part of it that we're told he sent his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And he says to his brothers, having recognized him, having been reconciled to him, go home and share the good news. What was the good news? Joseph's alive. Joseph's exalted. Joseph's preparing a place for you. Now, for you students of the New Testament, you're already there. I know you're putting two and two together by now. This is the very message that Jesus sends us into the world with. Jesus is alive. He didn't just die for our sins. He rose again the third day. Jesus is exalted. He's there at the right hand of the Father in glory. Once more, Jesus is preparing a place for us that where he is, we may be also. Now, we've been forgiven even as they've been forgiven. We've been restored even as they were restored. And we have been commissioned even as they were commissioned to go share the good news. Some of you are familiar with the story of Legion. He was a demon-possessed guy uh, and uh, just 
not just a demon, but a legion of demons had possessed him. He couldn't be tamed by anyone. They'd chain him and he'd break the chains. He was carving himself up in a danger to others. He was living there among the tombs. He was completely gone, alienated from all comfort and and, and all peace and, and, and all fellowship. And Jesus comes to that shore where he was, frees him of the demons that had possessed him. The neighbors come and they see him sitting there in his right mind, clothed, conversing, normal, healthy, restored. And he says to Jesus, listen, let me go with you. But Jesus in response says this, and this is from Luke's gospel if you want to jot it and check it out at your leisure later. Luke 8, 39 and 40. Jesus' response to him is return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. Return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. See, this is the fundamental difference in reformation and regeneration. When a person reforms their life, they go around telling everyone what great things they've done for themselves. But when a person is born again of the Spirit of God, forgiven all sin, they go around telling what great things God has done for us. Now, he says, go home and tell. And I want to suggest to you that those people who know you best are in the best position to know that this whole thing's real. But I want to show you something happens to them as they return home that no doubt has happened to many of you. And if you've never shared your faith, and I won't embarrass you by saying, how many of you have ever or never shared your faith? By the way, if you are a secret agent Christian and you've never shared your faith with anybody, I, I want to tell you something. Everyone else is out of the closet. It's time for you to come out too. It's time to come out and stand up and live for Christ. And the place you first do that is at home. You go back to those people that are going to doubt you, no doubt. Man, my parents, when I first came to Christ, well, my mom had already passed, but my, my dad was around. And, and I came to him and told him I was born again. And he was like, he wasn't buying it, see. He'd seen me go through so many phases and fads. And to him, this was just another one. It took a while. But I want you to see what happens and how they overcame that because you're going to be able to do the same thing. As they send them back with all sorts of gifts, carts full of stuff, raiment and food and and all sorts of silver, they arrive and in verse 25, it says, They went out of Egypt, came to the land of Canaan, to Jacob their father, and they told him, saying, Joseph is alive. He's exalted, governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart stood still because he did not believe them. Don't be discouraged if you share your faith and people don't believe it. Oftentimes, that will be people's first response. But I want you to see how they overcame it. First, though, they testified as they were instructed. And that's what I'm encouraging you to do. You just go share your faith. Jesus is alive. He's exalted. He's preparing a place for us. And you share that reality. If they don't at first believe, then you simply share your testimony again. When they told them all these things, verse 27, which Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. Now, here's what's happening. He hears the testimony and he doesn't believe. So they repeat the testimony and they give evidence that it's all true. I don't believe it would do any damage to the text to say what he observed with them were the gifts given to them. And I want to suggest to you that when you're born again of the Spirit of God, you have been gift of everlasting life. Your very confidence that you're saved is something. You are given peace by God the Holy Spirit in the midst of trials, joy in the midst of trials. There is the fruit of the Spirit, love, and then there are the gifts of the Spirit that enable you now to minister spiritually and supernaturally. And as people observe your life and see that your life is lining up with the testimony, see? 
They're saying he's alive and he's exalted and he's preparing a place. And look at all he's given us. His spirit revived and he believed. And I believe the same thing will happen in your families and in your uh, households. That as you live it and you testify it and people can see evidence of it, well, good things are sure to happen. Well, verse 28, we find that they did for Jacob. Then Israel, who's also called Jacob, by the way, said, it is enough. I love that. This will do it. Your testimony and some evidence that your testimony is true, it's enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. No, I love this and here's why. He had not yet seen him. And see, we've yet to see Jesus, but we've believed why. We've seen transformed lives. We've heard the testimony. We have the sure word of God. We've believed and now we share with others as others shared with us. He says, I will go and see him before I die. One last consideration, one last thought. I said earlier, we're all going to die at some point. That's not an absolute. The last generation alive at the coming of Jesus for his church will never die. And if we are, in fact, that generation, and I believe we are wholeheartedly for many reasons, not time to go into any today, tapes are available. Um, I believe we very well may be that final generation. And when that trumpet blows and the, the call is made, come up, we who are alive and remain are going to join those who've gone before us at their time of resurrection and reuniting and restoration to the Lord. Completely, we're going to join with them in the air. We're going to be able to say today, though, I'm going to go see him. And he says, I'm going to go see him before I die. I like that. It reminds me that a generation will see him without facing death. But if he tarries and we die, you will see him. And you will bend the knee and you will acknowledge Jesus Christ is Lord. But today you have a chance to do that. And you need to know that though he is the Lord, he's not your Lord until you submit to his Lordship. He doesn't force you to serve him. He doesn't force you to go to heaven. Though he is Savior of mankind, he's not your Savior until you receive that salvation. Though he died that all might be forgiven, you're not forgiven until you confess you're a sinner in need of forgiveness. So today, if you've come so far as to be convicted there's remorse and you've come so far as to confess your sin and there's repentance don't just turn over a new leaf don't just try to reform your life receive jesus as lord and savior be born again of his spirit receive the testimony examine the lives of those around you and god will confirm to you you too can see him and will see him he's alive he's in glory And he's preparing a place for us. Lord, I thank you for my brothers and sisters. I thank you for the great privilege and honor of ministering your word to them. Lord, for just the joy and delight of watching them grow in you and flourish for you. I thank you, Lord, for the radical changes I've seen in so many lives here. Hopeless people, Lord, filled with hope people without peace or joy, filled with peace and joy. And Lord, you've given us a message. You're alive. You're exalted. You're preparing a place. And I pray that we'd be faithful as you told these brothers through Joseph, go proclaim the good news. And as you spoke to Legion personally, Go home and tell them what great things God has done for you. Lord, we recall Legion not only went home, but preached in his whole city and preached in the Decapolis in 10 cities, heralding everywhere he went that good news. I pray you'll enable us. You'll inspire us. You'll empower us to do the same. And today, if you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus, it's true. 
He's alive from the dead. He died for your sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day. He's exalted. He's at the right hand of the Father, and He is preparing a place that where He is, we may be also. Do you want to be with Him in glory? Do you believe the truth? Yes, it's by faith, but it's faith in a reasonable and rational offer of forgiveness and pardon. He paid the penalty for your sin and He offers to forgive you completely. If you're ready to say yes to Jesus for the very first time, well, every head's bowed, every eye's closed, I'd ask you to raise your hand, hold it high. You'll be saying, Sam, pray for me. I'm ready. I want to give my life to the Lord Jesus. I'm so tired of trying to make it, of trying to reform myself, of trying to be good enough for God. I want the forgiveness He purchased and that He offers and that's offered to me today. Anyone this hour, if there'd be any or many, let me see your hands. Let me pray with you and you will be forgiven every sin, born again, Anyone at all, this hour, this service. Lord, we who've experienced this miracle of restoration know that you're wanting us to spread the good news and that you're not ashamed of us or embarrassed by us. You're simply working in us. And I pray, Lord, that we will be bold and that we will live the life that would say it's all true and that people around us will come to say, I want to see this Jesus as well. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.